a credit sequence that announced who would die the following day. A fast food mascot whose destruction launched a curse on a baseball team and an evil spirit that will kill you after offering you toilet paper. These are just a few of the weirdest and creepiest urban legends that the great country of Japan has to offer. With a culture so rich and a history so detailed as theirs, it's no wonder that Japan has many of the world's greatest urban legends. The only problem is that here in the West we really don't know many of them. So in this iceberg I'm going to be doing a deep dive into Japanese culture to give you some of their weirdest and creepiest pieces of urban legends. We're going to start off with some perhaps more well-known pieces of urban legend and as the video goes on things are going to get very obscure. This is the Japanese urban legend iceberg explained. So yeah, I'm not actually able to read kanji, so I'm going to put the kanji word in there and then the English translation. So this first one is called the Teke Teke, and I have to put a disclaimer now, I'm probably going to mispronounce a lot of stuff in this video, I'll give it my best shot, but here we go, the Teke Teke. Legend has it that the Teke Teke is the ghost of a schoolgirl known as Kashima Reiko, who is said to have fallen onto a railway line where her body was cut in half by a train. She is an onryo which translates in English to a vengeful spirit who lurks in urban areas and around train stations at night. Now, due to her no longer having a lower body, she travels either on her hands or elbows, dragging her upper torso and making a scratching sound. The sound that she makes, teke teke, is where she gets her name from. If she encounters an individual, she'll chase them down and slice them in half at the torso, killing them in such a way that mimics her own disfigurement. The only way to get her to go away is to say where her legs were. So where are her legs then? Well, according to sources that I've found, a potential victim may survive if they say that her legs are on the Meishin Expressway. And it's important to remember the Meishin Expressway because in some tellings of the urban legend, they say that a person will see Teke Teke within one month of learning about her existence. And so if the prophecy is to be believed, within one month you will see the Teke Teke, so you have to tell her that her legs are on the Meishin Expressway. That's just one of the many, many stories I have for you today. We have over 30 and they're only going to get more weird, more obscure and more creepy from here on out. The next one is this in kanji, which I believe translates to the Hachisaku. So the Hachisaku is a eight foot tall creature. While this spectre appears to be female, legend states that it has a much deeper, more masculine voice. Description of what she looks like often varies, with some accounts saying that she's a withered old hag, whereas others claim that she is a beautiful woman, wearing all white with a wide brimmed hat. Still, her freakish height separates her from you or me, making her inhuman. Similar to the Teke Teke, this is yet another evil urban legend with the Hachishaku preying on predominantly 9 to 11 year old children. The reason for this is that children are still dependent on their families, and this creature will mimic their family members to lure them away. The legend began quite recently actually, only first surfacing in 2008 on a forum focusing on the occult. Actually quite similar to cryptids over here in terms of how they mimic voices of people to lure others away, and it's definitely a story that I haven't heard before, I'm sure you might not have either. Very fascinating. Our third entry today is the Kuchisake Ona. Again, if I happen to butcher the beautiful language of Japanese, I do apologize, I'm no expert. So the Kuchisake Ona is a vicious spirit of a woman described as having long, straight black hair, pale skin, and otherwise being considered beautiful, all except for a huge scar across her mouth. For this reason, her English translation is the slip-mouthed woman. Very blunt. <laughs> So the tale goes that she wears a face mask, and if you ever encounter her, she will ask you if you think she's beautiful. If you say no, she will kill you on the spot. And if you say yes, she will remove her face mask to reveal her slit mouth. Once again, she will repeat the same question. Once again, if you say no, she will kill you instantly. But this time, if you say yes, she'll cut your mouth to resemble hers. According to legend, the only way to get out unscathed is to either, and to be honest this might sound a bit sexist, either distract her with money or hard candies, or you can tell her that she looks average. Not hot, not ugly. Some also think that if you say pomade three times, this will stop her, pomade obviously being the stuff that you put in your hair, and it is impossible to run away from her due to her superhuman speed. Very distinct urban legend here, not like anything I've heard in the West. This leads me to a very interesting conversation about Eastern versus Western urban legends, because the first three urban legends on this iceberg were all female. 
And in fact, most of them, I'd say about 80% of them are all female urban legends. In the West, I think that they tend to be more male. It's always like Slender Man or Jeff the Killer or vampires tend to be male, werewolves tend to be male. So it's, it's very interesting how Eastern urban legends tend to be more centered around the female as the monster, whereas Western tends to be more focused around the male being the monster. What do you think about that? Please let me know in the comments because I'd be really interested to delve into that conversation. The NNN special broadcast. This is one I actually mentioned at the very start. It was quite difficult to find, but I did find it in the end. So the gist of it goes as follows. At some point in the early 2000s, at the dead of night, roughly 2.30 a.m., quite a while after broadcasting had finished, if you flick to the right channel, there would suddenly be a list of names, similar to that of a credit sequence that began to roll up on screen. A bit peculiar, but nothing too sinister, right? Well, this was finished with text that translates to Tomorrow's Sacrifice, accompanied with creepy imagery, sounds, and visuals. There's actually a video on YouTube that is a recreation of the event, but this is most famous for being one of the first sightings of the infamous Jeff the Killer image. To this day, the legitimacy of the claim that this happened is debated. It might just be a creepy pasta, but a very creepy story nonetheless. Apparently, it's quite similar to something called Local 58, but I wouldn't really know because I haven't heard that story before. Still, though, very interesting. The Red Room was apparently a flash site which has since been taken down with this story taking place at some point between the late 90s and early 2000s. The story goes that it was folklore at the time that if you got an advertisement for this Red Room you would soon die. Or at least this was the story that a young boy from Japan had heard from his friend. And one day whilst he was surfing the web this boy saw the Red Rooms advertised to him. He tried to shut it down, he tried to shut it down many times, but it kept popping up. The screen went all black and then suddenly a list of names appeared in red, one of which was the boy's friend that told him about the red rooms. When he saw this, according to legend, the boy lost consciousness. He didn't show up to school the next day and soon the rumour went round that he had killed himself, painting his room red with his blood. So obviously this was a creepypasta, a very disturbing one at that. These stories really hold no punches. The Answer Man. This is yet another more modern urban legend and this is definitely one I haven't heard before. So the idea is that 10 children will sit in a circle with their mobile phones. Each person will call the number of the person to their left. So person A will call person B, B will call C, C will call D and so on and so forth. They all do this at the exact same time, and so all of the calls won't go through. Instead, they say, the answer man will pick up, and you can ask any question in the universe to him and he will give you the answer. However, the story goes that once you've asked, the answer man will have a question for you. And if you are unable to answer or get the question wrong, it's said that a giant hand will appear from the phone and tear off a part of your body. So not the best party game, but a very creative story. Once again, this next entry is a more recent urban legend. So far, very few have been older urban legends, which is quite a surprise to me. Either way, this is a tale of the Kune Kune, a ghost story that has been circling around the internet since 2003. The Kune Kune is said to be found in countrysides, and they tend to be these small little black squiggles in the distance. Now, it's important not to look directly at it, because legend states that looking directly at the Kune Kune will drive the gazer mad. For this reason, we know very little about the Kune Kune, because everyone who has seen it has gone crazy. There is this story of an old man who recounted that his brother went insane after he had seen it, but once again, if one were to lay eyes on the creature, they would suffer the same fate. So not much can really be said about this bizarre creature. I don't know what it is about East Asia and Japan in particular, but they really do have a knack for horror storytelling. Red paper, blue paper. This is another story that I mentioned at the very beginning of the video. So this spirit is unlike anything I've heard of in the UK. Many of the stories on the list share similar concepts to stuff like Bloody Mary or whatnot, but the spirit of Akamonto is so distinct. So this urban legend claimed that there is a demon called Akamonto. 
and he goes around toilets in public, often school bathrooms, and particularly girls' bathrooms, because I guess he's a pervert or something, and asks if its intended victim wants red or blue toilet paper. I know that this is a custom in some countries where there'll be someone at the door that will hand you toilet paper or something, which is just very weird. I can't really wrap my head around it being from the UK, but apparently it does happen in some countries. Quite odd for me though. Either way, whatever you answer, it will then kill you. So you have to either reject its offer or run away or just ignore it. With that said, for whatever reason, if you want to die, I will let you know the difference between red and blue because there are differences. So if you choose red, according to legend, he will kill you in a very brutal way. Flaying and stabbing is the most common tellings of this outcome. If you choose blue, however, the chances are that he will strangle you until you turn blue or potentially he will drain all of the blood from your body. Some say that if you choose another colour, he will drag you into hell. And some say that if you ask for yellow in particular, he will shove your head down the toilet, essentially giving you a swirly. Very unusual spirit. The Seven Mysteries of Japanese School. I have a little story to tell you about myself here. When I was younger, I used to think that teachers were robots. I couldn't comprehend how someone would know so much, so I assumed that they were artificial intelligence. And one time, one of my teachers did the rosary in front of class, and I thought she was malfunctioning. I had no idea what was going on because she she had to do 40 Hail Marys. I thought she was malfunctioning in front of our eyes. It was crazy. So Japanese kids have a very similar thing. They have the seven mysteries of Japanese school. So in Japanese schools, there are these seven mysteries in order. The clock keepers, the Misaki stairs, the hall of mirrors, Shijima-san of the art room, the 4pm book stacks, the god of death, and Hanako-san of the toilet. Each of these mysteries are, I guess, guarded by a representative, and each one gets more creepy than the last. For example, while the first mystery explains the three clock keepers, Kako, Mirai, and Aoiya Kane of the past, present, and future, the third mystery, the Hell of Mirrors, has the ability to reflect the hearts of those who wandered inside of it. Those who are pure of heart will be able to escape it with no trouble, otherwise the mirror will change its appearance forever to reflect one's deepest fear, beckoning its victim to stay FOREVER. Utsuro Bune. Turns out UFO sightings are not just done in the West, they do it all over the world of course. So the year was 1803, and a mysterious object washed up on the Hitachi province on the east coast of Japan. Accounts of this discovery were detailed in 1825, 1835, and 1844. According to legend, on the 22nd of February 1803, an attractive young woman aged 18 to 20 years old arrived on a local beach aboard the Hollow Ship, which is the English translation for the Utsurobune. Fishermen brought her inland to investigate further, but this woman was unable to communicate in Japanese. She was reportedly very different from anyone else there. For example, she had red hair and eyebrows, something not traditionally associated with Japanese people, except in anime. Her hair had white extensions in it, and apparently she was a very pale pink colour, wearing clothes of unknown fabrics. I swear, if it was just a white person, that would be an incredibly underwhelming end to what a fascinating story this is. The fisherman then returned her and her vessel to sea, where it drifted away. Some theorise that this woman could have been an exiled princess from another part of the world, but others think that she was an alien and her ship was a UFO. As I said, the most detailed account of this was in 1825, and it really is tough to know. Obviously, we weren't back then, we didn't see it, there was no pictures back then, so it's hard to say if they were telling the truth. Maybe this woman was of Celtic origin, obviously with red hair, eyebrows, and what they said, like a light pink skin. Potentially, they could be saying that it was someone from Europe, and, and specifically maybe Scotland or Ireland. On the other hand, could it have been a alien? Could it have been a UFO? Obviously, white people, we have, you know, white skin, but some people might say it's a, like a pale pink colour. So I really don't know for this one. But it does console me to say that it's not just us Westerners that go about seeing UFOs. It is everyone, and of course it would be. But do you have any theories? If so, let me know in the comments. Hikiko-san was a young Japanese schoolgirl who was widely said to suffer from deformation, and for this reason, she was harshly bullied by her peers. So while the story has many variations, it's generally said that she has abnormally raised eyes and a mouth torn from ear to ear. She wears a white kimono, tattered and torn. This legend states that she drags children to their death on rainy days but she would never kill any child that has been bullied or harassed. However, to my knowledge, this story comes from a novel, a work of fiction that gained popularity in the early to mid-2000s. 
and based on the fact that it's quite similar to a lot of legends that I've already included, I don't think there's too much here, so for that reason I think it'd be a good time to move on. Hanako of the Toilet. I actually mentioned Hanako earlier in the Seven Mysteries of Japanese School, but she's back on the iceberg again, so I'll go into a more in-depth telling of her story because it's very interesting. I don't know what it is about all these Japanese urban legends and the toilet, but it seems to happen quite a lot. So just like the red paper, blue paper urban legend, this spirit allegedly haunts school toilets. Now, like most of these tales, the story varies telling to telling, but it's generally accepted that Hanako died during World War II. Some people think that it was due to an American air raid, others say that she was murdered by her parents, and some people think that she committed suicide in the toilets. She is described as having a bob haircut and allegedly wears a red skirt or dress. So to summon her, the people have to go to the girls' toilets in a school, usually on the third floor, and knock on the third stool and ask if Hanako is there. If she is, she will tell you, and depending on the rendition of the story you hear, some say that she will drag you into the toilet in towards hell, whereas other tellings of the story state that you will be eaten by a three-headed lizard. Quite out there, very creative though. I don't know where the three-headed lizard comes into play, but it's just out of nowhere really. Very out there, that last idea. So onto the second tier of this iceberg, things are getting more obscure. And this next piece of Japanese folklore is about a strange village out in the countryside that people claim to be inhabited by nothing but people with big heads. This is the Big Head O village because instead of a village name, a plaque that would usually read the village name, instead read Big Head O, or whatever the Japanese translation for that is. So according to the legend, it was entirely deserted, all except for one person with an abnormally large head. However, since its apparent discovery a few years ago, not a single soul has been able to find it since. Maybe if people arrive there, they're soon killed, or maybe it does not exist. Quite a short explanation for quite a short story. Another weird one here that does not need too much explanation. This next one is quite self-explanatory. It is the Jinmenken, which translates to human-faced dog. So yeah, human-faced dogs are a part of Japanese urban legend. People say that they appear at the dead of night in urban areas and are able to run at an extremely fast pace. Apparently they can talk, but prefer to be left alone, with the first sightings of the creatures dating back to 1810, with legends spreading throughout the entirety of Japan over the next 200 years. Purple Baba, also known as Murasaki Baba, is the next urban legend I want to talk about, and straight up I have a problem with this woman. This bitch also hangs out in school bathrooms. What the actual fuck could be going on in a school bathroom that every urban legend and their grand has to go and hang out there? But I digress. It's said that if someone sees Murasaki Baba in the bathroom, they will get their liver removed. But if you say Murasaki three times, the old woman will disperse. In another variation of the story, she pops out of mirrors in the bathroom. So just like all of the other entries on this list, the tale will vary based on who you ask. Here's a question to you. Why do you think so many Japanese urban legends take place in the bathroom? I have absolutely no idea, so I'd really like to hear your thoughts down below because I am I'm so bewildered and perplexed why three or four different Japanese urban legends all hang out in school bathrooms. No clue weird, but it's very entertaining and yeah, let's move on. The Bento Curse is a very fun and interesting story I have for you. So apparently there is an urban legend revolved around the Chiba Lotte Marines baseball team in Japan, and the idea is that if merchandise commemorates a certain player, something horrible will happen to said player. For example, after Hideki Arabu was the first in his team to have a food promotion in his name, he then broke up with the team and moved to the New York Yankees. However, after only eight minor league appearances, he soon found himself on the bench. His time at the Yankees was difficult to say the least, and after only two years, he was traded away, signing for the Montreal Expos and Texas Rangers before going back to Japan to play for the Hanshin Tigers, and finally hanging up his boots in 2004. This is not where his story ends, however, as off the pitch, alcohol and a strained marriage would put pressure on his life, causing him to kill himself in July 2011. 
Obviously, there have been many sports signings that did not work out amazingly, and there have been many sportsmen and women to commit suicide. But unfortunate circumstances happened to essentially all of the players in the Chivalossi Marines team. In fact, unsavory events happened to nine players who had merchandise made about them. Here is an urban legend for you. Whilst I was halfway through making this script, this one in particular, I guess I shut down for the night, and I haven't been able to find the Wikipedia page since. Honestly, I have been scratching my brain, scouring the internet, and I can't find the page that taught me about this in the first place. My question is, does it exist? I honestly can't find it anywhere. I'm sure it does, I know it does, but it is just completely vanished for the life of me. It's vanished. Very strange. Jet Baba. So from what I found online, this is another weirder story. To my knowledge, as her name might suggest, Jet Baba is an urban legend about an old woman who can run really fast. She has the legs of a jet, I guess. She runs at speeds, almost as if she had a jet engine on her back. Allegedly, she can overtake cars with how fast she is, and I believe Baba is like old woman or something, so this is very impressive. They say that she appears on highways at the dead of night, but it's hard to get a good glimpse of her because she is just so fast. Either way, we're starting to get into the really obscure stuff here because this is such a niche urban legend. Sunakeke Baba is yet another yokai from Japanese folklore. From this sweet wiki article that I found, the Sunakeke Baba is a yokai who appears in the Nara and Hyogo prefectures folklore, so just west of Kyoto. Apparently she throws sand at travellers, hence her name, Sunakeke Baba translates to sand throwing hag. And this sand flies in their faces and blinds them while she chuckles about it and disappears. This one could definitely be real, I'm not gonna lie. I'm sure there are a bunch of old women in the world that just wanna wait for travellers <laughs> and just throw sand in their face and run. According to the article, she doesn't mean to cause any lasting harm. She's just a bit of a trick to this Sunakeke Baba. Probably the first folklore character on this list that isn't evil and straight up trying to kill people. Onto the third tier now, and this next entry is probably my favourite of the entire iceberg. This one is so well written, so good. This is the Kirasagi Station story. Originally posted to 2chan about two decades ago, this story is narrated by a person known as Hasumi. And Hasumi claims that something very peculiar happened to her train on one fateful day. It's the train I always take to and from work, but it hasn't stopped at any stations for about 20 minutes now. It always stops every five minutes, or at most every seven or eight, but it hasn't stopped at all. There are currently five people on board, but they're all asleep. Wait, it looks like we're about to stop. We stopped at Kirasagi Station, but I wonder if I should get off. I've never seen or heard of the station before. I think I should go back. I've been looking for a timetable, but I can't find anything. The train stopped, so I wonder if it would just be safe to get back on. I called my parents to come and pick me up, but they don't know where Kirasagi Station is. They said they'd look it up on the map and come back to me, but I'm kind of scared. I went to look for a public phone, but there aren't any. The other passengers didn't get off, so I'm just alone right now. The station name is, is definitely Kirasaki Station. There really is nothing around here. All I can see is grasslands and mountains. But if I follow the railway tracks, I think I can get home. So I'll do my best. I can hear what sounds like the beating of drums coming from far away, mixed with the sound of a ringing bell. Honestly, I don't know what I should do anymore. I can't walk anymore, and I also can't run. I'm still alive, I fell over and I'm bleeding, but I'm holding onto the heel I broke. I don't want to die yet. I did my best and somehow I'm in front of the tunnel now. Wait, I see someone. The sound is getting closer, so I'm just going to have to gather up all my courage and try and get through. I'll post again once I'm through safely. I've exited the tunnel. Someone's standing just ahead of me, so it looks like what you guys suggested was the right answer. Thank you. I'm probably going to be mistaken for a monster. My face is a mess of tears. The person was very kind. They said they would take me to the closest station. So we've started getting closer to the mountains now. He's been muttering about something I can't understand for a while now. I don't think there's anywhere for this car to stop, and he's stopped talking to me entirely. My battery's about to die. Things are looking strange, so I'm just going to run the first chance I get just so I'm ready when needs be. I'm gonna make this my last post for now. That was the last post that Hazumi ever made. And what happened from there on out is a mystery, a surprisingly creepy tale. Very, very interesting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. The Satori is the next piece of Japanese folklore that I want to move on to. So apparently in Japanese folklore, these things are mind reading monkey-like monsters, said to live in the mountains of Hida and Mino, just north of the city of Nagoya. 
Their benevolence is debated. Some people think that they would kill humans if given the chance, whereas others believe that they simply wish to live in harmony. But as I said before, they can read minds, and apparently they can read and say what a person is thinking before they can. So if they are evil, they would be an incredibly difficult opponent to defeat because they know what you're going to do before you do it. Some people think that these Satori are child incarnations of mountain gods who have come to ruin and have returned as yokai, but their sightings are very rare, so for as much as we do know, there's so much more that we don't. Mary's Phone So this is actually an anglicised version of the original Japanese story. Obviously these are Japanese urban legends, Mary is not a Japanese name. Originally it is the Rika doll, but because on the iceberg it says Mary, I'm just going to stick with Mary. So the story goes like this. A family was getting ready to move houses, when their young daughter's doll, Mary, was accidentally thrown away. The girl was extremely sad and wept to her parents who said they would buy her a new doll. As she got used to life in a new place, the girl eventually forgot about Mary-san. Then one night, before her parents got home, she got a call. Her parents hadn't returned yet, so she answered, It's Mary-san. I'm in the bin. The phone hung up. The girl thought that this might have been a prank, and she didn't really think much of it. But a short while later, she received another call. It's Mary-san. I'm at the station now. The phone hung up. Mary? That was the name of the doll she lost. That station, it was near her house. For a prank call, something was strange the girl began to think. Getting more scared now, the girl decided to call her mother, but as she was about to hit the dial button, she got called again and accidentally answered. This is Mary, son. I'm in front of your house. The girl went to check, but when she did, no one was there. So she decided to run back in and she locked herself in her house as the landline phone rang. Now, this was the same phone that she had used to call her mum, and it was off the wall. Ringing off the wall. This was impossible. So she picked it up. It's Mary Sam. I'm behind you now. I mean, yeah, this is a classic horror trope being contacted by impending danger, getting closer and closer and closer, and there's nothing you can do about it until right at the end they switch it around. A bit far fetched at times, but I am sure I've heard similar stories over here. Still, though, a very cool story. So, in August 1967, there was a huge flood in Japan that killed many and displaced others. To commemorate this, in 1970, they erected a big statue named Echigo Tainai Cannon, and people came from all around to pay respect to the victims. A year later though, in 1971, there was a man in the city of Niigata who came to worship the Tainai Cannon, and nearby he picked up a stone to commemorate his time there. When he got home, however, he accidentally dropped it and he went to pick it up when he realised that there was a face on the stone. The face of a child, only a few centimetres wide in size, but very distinguishable. Confused, the man spoke to locals about the stone, and one woman said that it looked exactly like one girl who had perished in the flood. The stone has since been enshrined, and many people believe that the spirit of the girl inhabits the stone. Is this a simple case of pareidolia, or is it something a bit more supernatural? I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. Very short tale here, the Injection Man is, according to folklore, a monster covered in bandages that waits for children to finish school, hiding behind corners where he can't be seen. And as an unattended child walks by, he springs out, injecting them with poison. According to Bintaro Yamaguchi, a ghost researcher, he estimates that this urban legend is down to medical mistrust and fear of vaccines. This urban legend is also very, very obscure, so I haven't been able to find too much on it. All I know is that this dude just pops out, gives him the old Jackie, <laughs> and that's the long and short of it. Speaking of obscure monsters, this next one follows suit because the Tonkatron is the final entry on the third tier of this iceberg, and he is very, very fun. Apparently, he brandishes a large Japanese sword, and if you don't obey his orders, he will use it. He's also riding a bicycle so he can outspeed you, but the idea of a mummy riding a bike whilst holding a massive sword is just hilarious to me. This is such a weird and wacky urban legend. So his story is that he will come up to you and say his name, Tonkatron, and you need to say it back to him. If you don't, he will kill you, wrap you up in bandages, and you too will become a Tonkatron. However, if you preemptively say his name without him giving you the permission, he will also kill you, wrap you up, and turn you into a Tonkatron. You can only say it once he says it. However, another way to avoid him is to wear a bandage on his left hand, because if he sees this, he will leave you alone. Very peculiar monster, but his legend is just fun. 
onto the fourth tier, we almost have a bit of a riddle, a bit of a puzzle here, a very fun story, and one explained to me by Suhamit Chan on Twitter, who helped me research a few of these. So the tale goes that a group of four travellers were stranded on a snowy mountain and the sun was setting. About to freeze to death, the four set off for a shelter that was supposed to be nearby. All four of them managed to make it to the shelter alive, but there was no way to start a fire. Falling asleep with freezing cold bodies and wet clothes, they would likely freeze to death. So they thought of a plan to stay awake. Each of them would stand in one corner of the room, and they would number themselves one to four. Number one would walk counterclockwise along the wall and tap number two on the shoulder. After getting tapped on the shoulder, number two would walk to the corner where number three is and tap him on the shoulder too. Number three would go and tap number four, and number four would walk across and tap number one again, starting the cycle over. And just like that, they slowly walked in that order and managed to survive the night. The shelter was pitch black, and in their fatigue, they barely spoke to each other. But by patiently continuing their survival method, they managed to make it until dawn. But the next day, as they were coming down the mountain, they realised that what they did was impossible. The explanation for this is kind of confusing, so I'll draw it out for you. So again, number one would go to two, number two would then go to three, number three would go to four, and then this is where it gets interesting because number one's already moved to where number two was, and therefore, if number four was to go across the room to number one, he would not be there. So how did number four tap number one on the shoulder? If they did exactly what they said, there would have to be a fifth person in that cabin. A fifth person who wasn't seen. A fifth person who never let his identity be revealed. The curse of Colonel Sanders. You heard that right. This is one that I featured at the very start of the video, kind of tease you a little bit with it. And yes, this is a real urban legend in Japanese folklore. This entry is referring to a 1985 curse cast at the Hanshin Tigers baseball team by the ghost of Colonel Sanders, creator of KFC of course. The curse was said to be placed on the team because of the Colonel's anger over the treatment of one of his storefront statues, which was thrown into the Dotonbori River by celebrating Hanshin fans because of their team's victory in the 1985 Japan Championship Series. As is common with sports related curses, the curse of the Colonel was used to explain the team's subsequent 18 year losing streak. Some fans believe that the team would never win another Japanese series until the statue had been recovered. And the team has appeared in the Japan series three times since then, losing in 2003, 2005 and 2014. Now, team curses in sports are nothing new, especially in baseball. There was the curse of the Bambino, which people claimed stopped the Boston Red Sox from winning the World Series. And that curse was only broken in 2004, with them last winning the World Series back in 1918 before then. Obviously earlier we spoke about the bento curse, and this is kind of similar. Speaking of which, Hideki Arabu, the first guy that got the bento curse, as I said earlier, had signed for the Red Sox, and then he went to the Hanshin Tigers, which means that that man played for three cursed baseball teams. This isn't dark by any means, but it's very odd urban legend and something that I have never heard of before. So you learn something new every day. And now I want to tell you the story of a woman named Kashima Riko. She suffered from abuse at home and was bullied at school. With no place to go, the girl considered suicide and threw herself onto the railway tracks. Her lower body was severed, but she didn't die straight away. Her upper torso spent some time crawling around, looking for the lower half of her body that had been cut off. Now this is where the fun part happens, because they say that Kashima Riko will appear to someone within three days of them first learning about her and try to steal their legs, or the lower half of their body. So unless you want Kashima Riko to come and steal your legs, you have to share this video. Checkmate. <laughs> I've shared it with all you guys, so you guys now have to share it with someone else. Just like those shitty old Facebook posts of like the girl from the ring, it's like, oh share or she'll come for you in three days. Stupid, but you know, it's kind of rules, it's Japanese urban legends. This story is kind of a combination of two others it's obviously the you have to share this or else the person will come for you you have to pass on the message and it's also the old trope of ghost stories coming true now Kashima Riko has many origin stories and variations of her tale she's kind of similar to the Teki Teki in a lot of ways and I just told you one but some people say that she was hit by a bomb some people said that she was tortured by American soldiers and some people say that she was hit by a train and once again the only way to get her to stop coming is to tell someone about her or else. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed, please do subscribe. Hit that big red button. I dare you. I would love to have you as part of the community. If this video does well, I might do another one that's similar to it about various countries, different urban legends. I think that would be really fun. I have an Instagram and a Twitter that you could follow. I have a Discord that you can join and I have a Patreon that you could support. 
there's my patrons up there. Thank you guys so much for helping me out. All of the links will be in the description. Also, a huge shout out to Rafiki1923 for creating this iceberg and Diatrip and Super Meat Chan for helping me research it. Obviously, this was in Japanese, so it was very hard for me. So out of the kindness of their hearts, they have helped me. Thank you very much, you two. By the way, Diatrip is a YouTuber, so definitely do go sub to him. His content is great. And finally, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next, because I'm only 103 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.